Okay, so welcome back. Um, in case you hadn't noticed, there was this little recording block down here in the bottom right corner. Um, that is uh, where essentially I'm going to be starting like recordings and stuff. So I'm going to need a coach. Um, I call it the coach. It's basically someone to make sure that before I start doing a lecture or some kind of tutorial that I'm actually recording. It happens probably once every other class or so. I'll forget to record something and that really sucks. But anyway, let's recap what we went over on Tuesday um, and then we can actually go into our first assignment. So right off the bat here, um, the the syllabus, again, is available for you um, in the, the class folder. So that's under the X drive, K Grenling, and then ARC 2, uh, 16 fall, ARC 221. And this is where you have the syllabus. And I haven't fixed the typo yet, but um, yeah, anyway. So you can find the syllabus right there. Um, and we went over this on Tuesday. So I'll just, I'll let you read it and we can talk about it, you know, sort of offline later on. But you'll also notice that the, uh, the folder here, assignment one prep model, um, is new, right? You guys didn't have that on Tuesday. So this is essentially going to be our write-up for what the first assignment is going to be. <clears throat> um, and I gave you the actual Word file rather than like a PDF so that you could get in there and take notes on it or anything that you need to do, you, you know, have at it. So anyway, um, assignment one, it's basically going to be our base model. Okay, this is going to be the place where we start to test some of the materials and settings and shade and shadow um, and lighting effects. Um, so this is planar superimposition. So for those of you who have gone through the design classes, I think it's, I think it's still part of the design class. They might have been taken out, but... Um, planar superimposition is, um, we're going to be trying to look at depth in what is otherwise a, a non-spatial condition. So it's essentially a depth perceived wall type construct, whatever you want to call it. We'll take a look at it in a, sec in a uh, second down the bottom. Um, but what we're doing is we're creating an enclosure and this enclosure is going to be essentially three adjacent sides of a cube, which you'll see in the pictures below, um, and one corridor space. So for those of you who have done this project, that part's new. And that's so that we can start to look at interior perspective um, view setting and camera angles and stuff like that. So um, I'll go through all of this stuff in detail in a moment, but what I really want to start with is just showing you the images. So these are the images of what we're going to do. So you can all breathe a sigh of relief. The images that I showed you on Tuesday were really intense, so we're starting off pretty simply. Okay, so it's a little bit of review for some of you, and it's definitely an easy way of gearing up for this class for those of you who don't know as much Rhino. So anyway, we're gonna be building a series of uh, beams and planar members, and then we're going to construct it into an enclosure. And so this enclosure, like I said, it's a three-sided, um, three adjacent sides of a cube, and then we're going to have sort of a corridor condition. So um, what I'm going to focus on here, and this is pretty much just a one-day assignment, and it'll be due um, on Tuesday when we come back. But um, what I'm going to focus on here with this tutorial is I'm not going to go through all the minutia of building a box, you know, how, you know, setting your coordinates and typing in coordinates. I'm going to jump straight to explaining how do you use the gumball to your advantage? What are the best hotkeys to get this done the fastest, right? How do you stretch and push and pull and, and make this thing a more pliable sort of design exercise? Um, so if you need a little bit more supplemental learning on the fundamentals, we can, we can try to work that in, you know, in office hours or I can give you some resources for that. But don't worry, it's super easy. You'll catch up just fine. All of you have enough experience. Okay, any questions on it so far? All right, so let's go back up to the specifics. So these are your rules for this. Um, you have a, a series of prescribed plane and beam sizes, and those are listed right here. So your planes are gonna be one and a half inches thick, and they're gonna be 10 feet by 30 feet, 15 feet by 25 feet, and 20 feet by 20 feet. So you've got a square one, you've got a, a uh, you've got, I, I'm not sure if that's the golden 
ratio. But uh, and then you've got a 10 by 30, which is a 1 to 3. So that's pretty. That's a pretty nice ratio. So anyway, um, the beams. Then you're going to have a 4 by 8 beam. You're going to have a 6 by 12 beam and an 8 by 16 beam. Notice that these are feet. These are inches. Um, just be careful of that. Um, the next part. Yes. How long are uh, that's a good question. How long are the beams? Um, they will be whatever size you need them to be. Okay, so we'll talk through some of the rules above in just a moment. But um, this stuff down here, um, it more relates to what's going to come in the future. But essentially, you're going to have three different materials for each of these, um, each of these item types. So for your planes, you're going to have opaque whites. You're going to have 50 to 60% translucence and you're going to have 15% translucence. So that basically means it's like a frosted glass, right? Like it's semi-transparent. Um, and then for the beams, you're going to have an 80% grayscale, 50% grayscale, and a 20% grayscale. So it's just going to be three different shades of gray, OK? So um, and then additional notes down there, everything that you're modeling is going to be on a 90 degree axis. Um, I want you to focus on smart modeling procedures, so you know not not getting bogged down in the details, but if you need that knowledge, we can work on it. And then um, the other thing is I want, you to, I want you to be in the practice of thinking ahead, right? So I, I liken um, design modeling a little bit like chess. You need to be thinking a few steps ahead at all times. So when I say um, plan ahead for expected material explorations through the use of layers, um, this model is actually a poor example because everything is showing in blue, everything's showing green, everything's showing red in each plane, but really it's going to be a slippage of each, right? Because when we get into Rhino, you'll notice that the materials, well, when we get there, it won't be today, but be aware that the materials are most easily applied by layer. So if you have all of these blue and you select the blue layer and you say, I want all of these to be translucent, then they're all going to appear as translucent glass when you render it. So be careful. You might want to have some of them red, some of them blue, some of them green, or whatever color palette you want to model with. Is that clear? Yes. So you're saying that the spots that would be different materials are would be in different colors? Then. A different layer. Yeah, different yeah. layers. Yeah. So, um, and I'll help you set it up, too. We're going to go through that a little bit today. Um, yeah. Uh, all right. So here are the rule sets. and. Um, they're, they're, more, they're more for you to go through the process of checking and double checking your own work to make sure that it's compliant with a design assignment than it is about me saying it absolutely has to be this way. Okay, so just bear that in mind. It's not, it's not like you're gonna fail if you don't meet it. I'm just saying this is something to aspire to in your design exercise, okay? So each element type, meaning a plane or a beam, um, <clears throat> may only connect to the opposite element type. So you can't have a beam attaching to a beam. You can't have a plane attaching to a plane. Um, secondary connections can be made on other faces of an object. So if you have a beam attached to the face of a plane, you can attach a secondary face on the other side of the beam. Does that make sense? Or on another 90 degree face. Um, you can um, only have one connection per side of an element, so you can't put one. Um, if this is, you can't put one beam on a plane and then another beam on a plane over here on the same face. Um, and then no butt connections at the end of a beam, so you can't take a beam and die it straight into the side of a plane. Okay, so pretty simple parameters, um, but we're not going to get totally hung up on it. It's just something to be thinking about during the design process. So I think that just about covers everything for the exercise of preparing the model. What questions do you have? Yes? Can the beam go through a plane, or is it just this plane? I'll allow it. Yeah, I'll allow a beam to go through a plane. Yeah. Any other questions? When you say no but connections at the end of a beam, um, you mean that the beam should be rotating when it touches a plane? Yes, it should be face to face, like not so. Basically, like uh, here we go. If this is my beam, you can't do this. Okay. Okay. Make sense? Yeah. You can do this. Get it? Okay. Not perpendicular. 
What's that? Not perpendicular, but parallel? More perpendicular, parallel, whatever, as long as it's on a 90 degree axis. Okay. As long as it follows the red, green, or blue axes. Yes? Oh. Okay, so um, we're going to jump into Rhino here in a moment. So you guys should all make sure that you can log in properly if you didn't troubleshoot that on Tuesday. Um, let's do that now. Get Rhino open. Make sure that you open the 64-bit version. 